Hey everyone, welcome to Bowling Brook Church. We are so excited that we are able to worship together today. If this is your first or second time joining us, we want to get to know you a little bit better. In the description bar, you'll find a link called Next Steps Card. If you just click on there, answer a few questions, it helps us know how to serve you better. And if you're watching today with kids between the ages of zero and 11, don't forget about the great kids programming over at Disciple Town Kids. You'll find that on our church YouTube page or Disciple Town Kids Facebook page. It's a great place for kids to hear Bible stories, do crafts, sing songs, all while helping to deepen their faith. And now as we begin worship, we invite you to just welcome the spirit wherever you are as we worship together. Family, wherever you find yourself, we want to invite you to worship with us. Whether you're in your kitchen, in your bedroom, the bathroom, the dining room, or even in your car, we invite you to just lift up a praise this morning to God because he's due glory. So help us right here. He's coming on the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring so with power and fighting our battles. Fighting our battles. Every, knee will bow. every knee will bow me. Come on, somebody say, him. Our God is yeah. Our God is He's the Lamb. lamb.
This I know with all my heart His wound have paid my ransom But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom Victory belongs to Jesus Victory belongs to him 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 Good morning, Bolingbroke Church family. Thank you for being with us today. Please join me for a moment in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day, for this opportunity to get together and to worship you, Lord. What a blessing and a joy it is to have this day where we can set aside all of our cares and worries of the week and just come together and praise your holy name. I ask a special blessing upon each person watching today, Lord. Please bless their homes and their families. Uh, please create a desire in us, Lord, to get to know you better so that joy that we have that comes through knowing you, we can share with others. We thank you for your mercy and grace that you continually extend to us. Lord, we love you and we thank you in your name. Amen. My family and I just got back from spending two weeks in Southern California. And for those of you who don't know, Southern California is where I'm from. We haven't seen family because of the pandemic. And so we finally had this trip and everyone was there. My brother flew in from New York. We flew in from Chicagoland. My sisters already live there. My parents live there. And so one of the things that you do when you go back home, at least for me, is I go to places that I like to eat. So I hit up all of my favorite places, but above all of these places in the town that I used to live in, in the town of Orange, there was this donut shop that was open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Kara and I love donuts. And the nice thing about this, this was literally a mile from where we used to live in Old Town Orange. And so my brother and I were out doing errands. We went shopping. We did a couple of things. And then I said, hey, on the way home, I'm going to take it to this donut shop because he lives in New York. So we go to this place, DK Donuts, like I said, 24 hours a day. They would drop their donuts fresh early in the morning and then at 10 o'clock at night. I know this because Kara would often ask me at 1030 at night, hey, let's go get some donuts. All right. So we go there. We get a dozen donuts. I'm excited. I'm already starting to eat those donuts because there is no way that I was waiting to get to my parents' house before I was going to have some donuts. So we're driving. We're talking. We're going down Chapman Boulevard, which may not mean anything to you, but I'm driving down there because we're trying to get to the freeway that's going to take us to my parents' house. And as I approach the freeway, I just drive right past it because in my mind, I was going home. I thought I was going back to the house we lived in three years ago because that's what we do sometimes. We, we just go on autopilot. You've driven places. I know you have where you've driven home and you think to yourself, like, did I even drive here? Did I make that right turn? Did I make that left turn? Like, how did I even get here? Because I was spaced out. Like we do that when we're driving, but I think more importantly, we sometimes do that with our lives. We just live our lives on autopilot, hardly paying attention to being intentional in our lives. We, we succumb to the routines of our lives. If you look back over the last month of your life, you could probably take an inventory and see that 90% of the time you woke up at the same time and you went to bed at the same time, and you might even have the same kind of meals day in and day out. And I know for me, one of the things that I do at night when Kara's putting our daughter down, I'll, I'll go on my phone and I'll just start looking at YouTube and watching videos or listening to a podcast. And what I realize is that that's become such an organized behavior in my life that like I was literally just cruising through my evenings, like scrolling through YouTube. I think we do this with our lives as a whole where one day we wake up and we wonder to ourselves like how did I get here 
Like, how did the years pass by so quickly? I'm turning 40 this year. I thought I would be 20 forever, but now I'm almost 40 years old. I'm almost at the middle of my life. I'm, I'm primed for a midlife crisis, right? At least age-wise. But it got me to thinking, when we were flying back from California, I looked at my wife and I said, Kara, like, I don't wanna just go back to the routine of our lives. I don't want to just go back to the way things were. I don't I don't want to just go back on autopilot, but I want us to live our lives in a way that it's more meaningful, more intentional. Like I believe that God is calling us to live for so much more. See, God doesn't just want us to live for the weekend. I truly believe that God doesn't want us to just live for the two weeks a year that you have vacation or four weeks off a year that you have vacation, but that God has designed life so that you would live a more meaningful, more fruitful, more passionate, more intentional life. And I think that it's true because if we go back to the beginning, if we go back to God's original blueprint for our lives, we'll actually begin to see that, that God desires something so much better. And I don't want you to think like, oh man, well, my life is terrible, so there's no way that God is wanting this for me. But I think if you'll just give me a few moments and an open mind and an open heart, I think that God's gonna share with us like a new truth for us, that God's gonna set some of you free. God is gonna give some of you uh, a new vigor for your life, new passion for your life. And so I wanna, I wanna, I wanna pray with us first. Let me pray, let me calm myself down because I'm getting excited. And then let's jump into the passage and see what God has for us today. Heavenly Father, we come before you into your presence because we know that there's no better place to be on earth. And so I ask now that as you speak through me and as the hearers hear the word, that you would use this time to continue to shape and transform us, that you would continue to cultivate and give us a new imagination for your desire for our lives and for our church. So Father, we thank you in advance for the blessing of your word and for you what you will do with it. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. So I wanna look at Genesis chapter one, verse 26. The Bible says, Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in His image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. You know, we get this snapshot of God in his heavenly court, wherever that is, whatever it looks like. God had already created everything else. He'd created the fish, the birds, the sea, the mountains, the flowers, the plants, the sky, the stars, the sun, right? God had created everything. And then God has this moment where he says, I am going to create mankind and I'm gonna make him different. Than all the animals. I'm going to make him different from all the other things I've created. And, and in fact, I'm going to make humankind, men and women, in my image, in my likeness. Now, commentators, theologians would argue over what it means that you and I are made in the image of God. So there's some people that will say that to be made in the image of God means that because you have rational thought, because you're logical, because you can feel emotions because you can be empathetic and sympathetic and compassionate and gracious and forgiving, that all of those things mean that that's what God is like. There's other people that will literally say that, no, 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 like to be made in the image of God means that, that we as human beings with arms and legs and head and nose and hair and all that stuff, that that's what God looks like. So, so there's just this debate between what it really means. But one of the things that I learned through my study is that in the ancient world, only the king, only an emperor, only a pharaoh, only the noble at the very top. Only they were thought to be created in the image of God. I mean, they would literally say that, that the king is made in the image of God. And so whatever the king wants, the king gets. And whatever the king decides is what will be done because in essence, he is speaking for God. But when we look at the story of creation in scripture, there is no qualification for only people at the very top 
are made in the image of God. Not just the powerful, not just the rich, but rather that all of humanity, all of mankind, which means you and I are made in the image of God. And what that means is that just as a king's understanding was that he was bringing the reign of God wherever he went, that you and I being made in the image of God, that we are literal image bearers of God, which means that your life, where you work, with your family, with your kids, with your friends, with your neighbors, where you go to the gym, where you go to the grocery store, when you come to church, that your life isn't just about getting through the day, but that God is asking you to be an image bearer, which means that you are this viceroy, this this regent, this ambassador of God wherever you go which means that even in the job that feels like a dead end, God is asking you to be his image. That even in the marriage that you feel you would rather end, that God isn't asking you to end that marriage, but God is asking you to live up to the image of God. That wherever you go, you are bringing the reign of God. See, the thing that happens is you're either giving a clearer picture of God's goodness to others by the words you say, by how you treat people, by your behaviors, by your attitudes, or you can distort the image of God by your words, your actions, your thoughts, your perceptions. You see, when we look at what God desires for us is that God wanted you to live your life in such a way, regardless of career, regardless of where you live, regardless of position in life, but that you are made in the image of God. God, you are the image bearer of God wherever you go, which means that your life is sacred and what you do with it actually matters. You know, sometimes we think that calling is only for pastors or people that go into ministry. But in reality, when we look at this story and when we look at the blueprint for God, for what God desires for humankind, right here in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, it says that God tells um, this heavenly court that he wants Adam and Eve and all of humanity that come after him to subdue the earth, to have dominion over the earth. He says it twice. Now, when we hear this word dominion, we we sometimes think that it's about dominate. And so we have this idea that that we are here to exploit the earth. We're here to dominate the earth. We're here to do what we want with it. But for the Hebrew word, to have dominion or to subdue something isn't actually to power over it, but it's to take care of, to be a steward of, to be a manager of God's resources in our lives. But I think that it's hard for us to see the world that way because we're such consumers. So let me give you an analogy or a story. When we were in California, one of the things we were looking forward to was celebrating my daughter Everly's second birthday. Now, she's been two years old since April 8th. I mean, we celebrated at home, just the three of us. We uh, had pizza and cake here at the church with my staff. We celebrated in Tennessee. And now when we were going to California, we were celebrating for the fourth time like i think we've ruined her she literally thinks that every day is her birthday so she sings happy birthday every day and she asks for a candle and a cake like she knows how to blow out candles like our daughter is so amazing but i think we've ruined her but we were excited because we were going to celebrate and and when we got there my sister went all out you can look at my facebook page there's an arch of balloons there's it was Minnie mouse theme there was mini mouse cutouts there was her name written in disney script my sister made rice crispy treats with icing and sprinkles and sugar cookies like from scratch there was a cake i mean it was like like it was a pretty amazing thing to see what my sister and her family did to create this environment and this space for my sweet princess daughter Everly. But one of the things that was funny about it, so leading up to us coming to California, my dad asked Everly, hey, for your birthday, do you want a pinata? And Everly being (laughs) the funny girl that she is, she says, I want dos pinatas, meaning I want two pinatas. And so my dad's like, sure, I'll get you two pinatas. I'll get you as many pinatas as you want. Because she's still the youngest. She's still the baby, so she's going to get spoiled. So we get there, and my dad has a Minnie Mouse pinata filled with candy, and then a second pinata that was filled with, like, balls and toys. And so we, we do what you do when there's a pinata. You hand every kid, beginning with the smallest one to the biggest one, a baseball bat or a stick, and you literally say, 
go ahead and hit Minnie Mouse as hard as you possibly can because the goal is to make a hole in the side of her head. Like, I know that sounds morbid, but think about that. That's what we do when we hit pinatas. But in the grand scheme of thing, I think that what's even more disturbing, and I know some of you are gonna disagree, but that's okay, is that as soon as that hole, or as soon as that pinata is destroyed and candy is flying everywhere, every little kid instinctively knows Yo, know, I just have to run in there and take as much as I want, as much as I can get, as fast as I can get. And if we're honest, like sometimes take from the littler kids the, to the, the candies that they have that we like, right? We've all done that because the little ones, it's harder for them to defend themselves. But we have this mindset from the very moment that we're kids. Take as much as I want, consume as much as I want, and then claim things to be mine. And they don't often like to share it. And we have to continually tell our kids, no, it's okay to share. It's good to share. Like Jesus wants you to share, right? But it's not just kids that, that have this consuming mindset. I mean, as adults, I think we, we take this cons consumer mindset. I mean, you can consume as much social media as you want. That scroll will go on for days. You can go onto Amazon, Netflix, Disney, whatever other streaming network you have, and you could probably for the next 10 years watch something every minute of every day. We like fast food because it's fast, it's easy, it's what we want. We, we drive up to our car and they hand us a bag of hot food, right? Even grocery stores, some of us don't even go into anymore. We order our food and then someone else comes and fills our trunk with all of the food that we want. Like, we're the consummate consumers. We just want more. And I think sometimes when we read a passage like this in Genesis chapter 1, where, where God tells us to subdue and to have dominion over the fish and the animals and the sea and the world, sometimes we have this consumer mindset and we just want to take as much as we can. And, and sometimes we do this with church. We come to church to consume this religious service, this product that the church makes, and we come and we get it. And as long as they're still making the recipe the same way, we're going to keep coming back. But the minute it's under new ownership, the minute they change the recipe at church, and we're not going to go there anymore. We're going to find somewhere else. Or even worse yet, we're, we're going to stop giving tithes and offering to, shoot, to really show them that I'm not happy with how things are. And we have this consumer mindset Oftentimes we attribute it to even God and our relationship with God. But we believe at Bolingbrook Church that God is calling you to live beyond a consumer. That God doesn't want you to simply be a consumer, but He wants you to be a creator, to participate in the ongoing work of creation. That is why when God says, I'm going to make mankind in my image, in my likeness, and then I'm going to ask them to subdue and have dominion to care for my world, that God was actually asking Adam and Eve to continue the work of creation, not just consume, but be a part of the work of creation. I mean, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 says that God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. You know, I used to think that when we got to heaven, we wouldn't have to do any work, right? Because work, sometimes you, we've all had those jobs we just absolutely hate. We've had those jobs that feel like work. And so I used to think, well, there's not going to be work in heaven. But then I went back to the beginning of scripture where it was still paradise. And part of God's original intention was that Adam would till and keep the ground, that Adam would still have a job. And so what we find in this first story about God's design and desire for our lives, that God's purpose for our lives, is that God wants you as an image bearer to continue in the work that God started at creation and God is asking you to be a part of His reign on this earth, in this place, in your home, in your family, in your work, in your church, that God wants you to live for so much more. God doesn't want you to live on autopilot. God doesn't want you to just wake up one day at the end of your life and wonder, where did my life go? But God wants you to live a life of meaning and purpose. You know, the Bible tells us that before you were formed in your mother's womb, that Jesus knew you and purposed for you something in your life. You know, sometimes we think that purpose is our calling. And sometimes we think that our calling is our career. 
And so we look at pastors and we say, well, the pastor is a preacher and he gets up on Saturdays and he preaches to us and he's lucky because he gets to have his career also be his calling. But I would say it this way, that my calling isn't to be a pastor, but that my calling is always to draw people closer to Christ, to to always point people to Jesus and then allow the Spirit of God to do what God does. You see, your calling isn't your career, but regardless of whatever career you have, God's calling on your life is for you to be an image bearer, always pointing people towards Christ by the words that you speak, by the actions of your hands, by the behaviors of your life, that God's original intention at creation was that you would be an image bearer and that you would continue in the work of God wherever you are. And so I would put it this way, that at creation, God announces to the heavenly court, he announces his intention for what he is going to do. He says, I want to create humankind in my image. And then God designates the purpose for humanity. He says, I am going to create humankind, his intention, in the image and in the likeness of who I am, and then I'm going to ask them to continue the work of creation. Not that we can create, but to continue to tend it, to steward it, to take care of the world all around us, the relationships in our lives, to care for the people we live next to. And then, and then God creates man and woman. So when God sets the intention for your life, it isn't about finding the right career, finding the right vocation, but it's about bringing the right thing to your career, bringing the right thing to your relationships, bringing the right thing to your workplaces, to your neighborhoods, to your homes, to your families. You see, part of God's original intention is that when He decides to make humankind, when He decides to make you into the image of God, what He's actually doing is He's inviting you not only to be a part of His family, but He's inviting you to continue in the work that He's already done. You know, we're so preoccupied with searching and chasing after the presence of God that we forget that God is asking you to be His presence everywhere that you go. That's why when Paul says to do everything in word and deed as though you are doing it unto the Lord, is that even in those moments when you feel like what you're doing is purposelessness, that's not even a word, if it's meaningless, if you're in a job that feels like a dead end, God doesn't want you to just give into that, but He wants you to bring into that moment the very fact that you were created in the image of God. So I want to look at one last passage, one short story that's only going to be one verse long that I think is going to help to continue to give context for the intention and the purpose and the design of God in your life. In Luke chapter 1, verse 80, right, the very last verse of a chapter, I mean, I don't know about you, but any time that I've been doing reading for school, uh, I've learned how to skim. I've learned how to read the first and last sentences of paragraphs, but generally the last sentence, it's just introducing the next chapter. So I just go to the next chapter. But when we come to the book of Luke chapter 1, verse 80, I want to read that to you. I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to give you context. Luke writes, the child grew and became strong in the spirit. And he was in the wilderness until the day he appeared publicly to Israel. So without context, this makes absolutely no sense. But here's what's happening. This is about John the Baptist. John the Baptist was said to be the one who was going to prepare the way for the Lord. Like literally his calling, his vocation was simply to be faithful to what God was asking him to do. God had already destined, God had already purposed to send Jesus to this earth so that he could show this world how much he loved them. But before Jesus begins his ministry, God sends John the Baptist to prepare it. Now the story tells us that John the Baptist's mom was too old, she was beyond childbearing years. But the angel of God comes to her and says, listen Elizabeth, you are going to have a son. And he is going to be the one who will literally pave the way for the Messiah. He will be the one to prepare the way. This was like a high calling, a high purpose. And the angel comes to his dad as well and says, listen, this is what's going to happen. And the Bible tells us in verse 80, 
It says that John the Baptist grew and became strong in the spirit, which is echoing the same words of creation when it tells us that God blessed Adam and Eve. It is the same words of creation in Genesis 2 when it says that God breathed his breath into the nostrils of Adam and Adam became a living being. This continually goes back to God is the one who does the work in your life. God is the one that blesses you. God is the one that breathes life into you. God is the one for like John the Baptist who helps you to become strong in the spirit. But now listen to this next part. And he, John the Baptist, was in the wilderness until he appeared publicly. He was in the wilderness before he was ready to publicly do the ministry and the thing that God was asking him to do. Now think about this, fam. Before, after Jesus was baptized, the Bible tells us that Jesus goes into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And in the wilderness, Jesus is tested. Jesus is battle tested and he overcomes the evil one. But before Jesus does that, the Bible tells us that John the Baptist was also in the wilderness. John the Baptist did the same thing that Jesus did, but before Jesus, because John the Baptist wanted to continue to be a part of the work that God was already getting ready to do. God's design for his life was simply to participate in this ongoing story of salvation. John the Baptist was not the Messiah. John the Baptist was not the one that people were waiting for. Jesus was, but John played a role in pointing people to Jesus. Or we could say it this way. John the Baptist was an image bearer to the Christ that was about to appear to Israel. And so in many ways, John the Baptist gives us a clear indication that when God intentions something in this world, he will call people into his work, not because God needs us. God can literally do impossible things. The Bible tells us time and time again that God literally does that which is impossible. God doesn't need us. God could literally handle everything. But part of the loving relationship that God has with us is that he is asking us, asking you to participate in the work of God, of drawing people to Him, of being a reflection of Jesus to others. But we live with this consumer mindset where we're just trying to chase after God because we want more of the goodness of God. We want more of the blessings of God. We want more of the miracles of, of God in our lives. And the whole time we forget that God is asking you to be His presence, to be His miracles, to bring healing to the lives of those that need you. We can't just be consuming after God, but we also have to be giving and being a part of the work of creation and being a part of the solution and the work of God. So when we look at God's original design, God is simply asking you to be faithful to where God has placed you in this life. Just as God places Adam and Eve in the garden, God has placed you right where you are. God has given you the family that you have. God has given you the job that you have. God has given you the home where you live. God has given you the friends. God has given you the church where you are. And God is asking you to live for so much more. Don't just be a consumer, but be a creator. Don't just be a consumer, but participate in the work of creation that God had started thousands of years ago and is still inviting you to live for that thing. Because when you're in a relationship with God and when you're in and you're doing the work of our Heavenly Father, you begin to realize that now you're not just living for yourself, but you're living for so much more, for something real, for something better, for something more grandiose. It's not just about the, the little things in our lives. It's not just about wanting to go through life on autopilot, but about realizing that what God intends for your life and what God purposes for your life is for you to be a part of the work of God. And just as John the Baptist 
was preparing the way for the Lord, we are also preparing the way for the Lord. And when John was in that wilderness, it was his life experience. It tells us that he spent most of his life in the wilderness, getting strong in the spirit, getting ready for what God was going to ask him to do. So what you've been through, the experiences that you have had, the relationships that you've been in, the jobs that you've had, the families you've been a part of, the pain and the suffering, and even the moments of victory and triumph, your failures and your successes, all of those things are continually working to prepare you as you participate in the ongoing work of God in the world today. So I don't want you to miss out on what God is asking you to do. I don't want you to miss out on being a part and being faithful to the life and the place where God has called you to. I don't want you to miss out on that because by not living into those moments and by not living into the reality that God is calling you and placing you there, you're going to miss out. You're gonna miss out on so much more and you may run the danger like Adam and Eve in the garden that the very thing they thought they needed ended up leading to their downfall. God gives Adam and Eve everything they need. He says, of all the trees, of all the plants, it is all yours. Just stay away from one tree, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Just, just stay away from it. everything else you can have. But because they were the, 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 the very first consumers, they went after the thing they thought they needed and it led to their downfall. I mean, how many times have you wanted something? How many times have you prayed for something thinking that it's the very thing that you need and God's like, All right, okay, I'll give it to you. I'll let you have this thing. And then once you have it, you realize that the thing you thought you wanted wasn't what you wanted at all. So I wanna invite you to continue to pursue the presence of God, knowing full well that by doing that, you are filling yourself with His presence so that you may take His presence, that you may prepare the way for Him, that you may be faithful to the thing that God is calling you to do. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for the fact that you are inviting every single one of us to be a part of the ongoing work of creation. And so, Father, we repent of the times where we've been consumers and we repent of the times where we've only sought for things for ourselves. And we ask that you would teach us to leave that life behind and allow us to be faithful to the work of creation. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. How's it going, church family? Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Today is a very special day for us. And like we've been talking about for the last two months, that every first weekend of each month, every first Saturday of each month will be dedicated to hosting baptisms for whoever desires or whoever feels the call of God to give their life over to Him in Jesus Christ. And we want to let you know that today at 1230, we're going to be filling our baptism troughs and baptizing two people today. Two people are deciding to give their life over to Jesus finally, and that's Christian Sanchez as well as Gerald Benny. We want to give them a round of applause from wherever you are. Give them some praise hands in the chat. And we want to support them. So come on out to our 1230 outdoor worship service where we can support these two young men in their journey to Christ. We want to thank you guys so much for praying for all of us, for praying for the people that are giving their lives to Christ. And we want to support them and let them know that the church is behind them and will help them on their walk with Christ. And we want to let you know that next week that we want to encourage you to invite people to your homes that if you feel comfortable to watch the service together as we have an online service. But we want to also let you know that as you guys gather together, that there's something that you can do afterwards to connect with the church. And that is coming to our very first church bonfire. That's right. Our very first church bonfire is next Saturday evening at 7.30 p.m. 
where you can enjoy s'mores and veggie and regular hot dogs as well. And we just want to enjoy each other's presence and be around each other again uh, during our virtual weekends because we believe connection is important here at this church. So come on out, our church bonfire, 7.30 p.m. next Saturday. Bring your family, bring your friends. We'll have s'mores ready for you guys. We'll have fires ready for you all. And we'll just enjoy the summer together. We also wanna to connect to our prayer line groups that are happening during the weekend. On Monday morning at 7.30 a.m., our prayer line happens where you can join and start your week off with prayer with our community. If you can't join the 7.30 a.m. Uh, group in the morning, you can also join our Facebook page, which is Bolingbrook Church Push Line, where you can join that group and we're happy to let you in. So you can share your, your requests and let uh, all of us know that uh, what you're going through and how we can help pray for you. And if you can't do that, let's say you're not on social media, go on our website, Bolingbrook.Church, and on our homepage, you can share our prayer request there. And we will make sure that that prayer request is prayed over constantly until we hear updates from you. We want to also thank everyone here for partnering with us. That's right, partnering, not just giving to this church, but deciding that this vision of creating spaces for the people that God missed the most has become important to you. You have become a space creator with us. We want to thank you so much for giving of your time and of your resources, things that we can't give back to you, but you give them so freely to help the vision of this church help the vision of heaven enter into the surrounding area. And now there are some ways that you can give of your time this month. June 17th, we have a blood drive from 3 to 7 p.m. here at the church. And like we said last week, there is a blood shortage usually every summer in the surrounding area hospitals. And we wanna help give and fulfill the need for the type of blood that is needed. Uh, so you can give up your time from 3 to 7 p.m. June 17th here at the Bolingbrook Church for our blood drive. We also have Feed My Starving Children, an event where you go and pack food for starving children across the world. We learned that over 6,000 children die each day of food insufficiency, food insecurity. And that is just simply not having enough food to eat every day. And we wanna help diminish that number down to zero. And you can help us do that by partnering with us as we partner with Feed My Starving Children. And that is happening on June 25th from 2 to 3.30 p.m. That's June 25th from 2 to 3.30 p.m. Go ahead and sign up in the link in the description below to be able to become a volunteer for Feed My Starving Children. Also, June 28th uh, at 4 p.m., the Bolingbrook Hospital, a hospital that we have been partnering with intentionally for the past couple of years, we have been partnering with them for food pantry. They're hosting their own food pantry that we wanna help uh, them with. And they're looking for 10 volunteers from our church to be able to help them with that food pantry that's happening, like I said, June 28th at 4 p.m. So if you're interested and if you are free, go ahead and sign up in the link in the description below. As always, you can continue to give your resources to the church on our website, bowenbrook.church forward slash giving. You can text to give, also you can Zell quick pay to info at bowenbrook.church. And we wanna let you know that every single cent, every single dollar goes to supporting that vision of creating spaces. And we wanna thank you so much for your partnership here at Bolingbrook Church. We hope to see you on our lawn at 12.30 today and celebrate the baptisms that are happening, the new lives that are happening in Christ. So be there, uh, we wanna see you there. And if not, we'll see you next week. Everyone take care, God bless and stay safe.